This is Michael Carnes from Exponential Audio. We're going to do a little section now that I'm calling Reverb 101 using the Exponential Audio Phoenix Verb Reverb. I'm going to walk you through a few basic things. I'm certainly not going to show you everything, but we'll see a few things that might help you to understand the way that reverberation works and can be used. It's always best to begin at the beginning, so we're going to start at the point that our audio source enters our theoretical room. Our first consideration is what sort of surfaces are around that source. Are they irregular? Are they regular? Are they soft? Are they hard? All of those things have an important effect on those initial reflections that hit our ear before almost anything else. They also have effects on the sound of the reverberation as it proceeds and then dies through the room. So the first place that we're going to look is a parameter that's called diffusion. We'll use our little snare drum here. It's got a sharp transient and it lets us hear the effect of what's going on. Diffusion basically controls the irregularity of the room. We're starting with no diffusion, value of zero, and we hear the sound of the snare drum pretty much unaffected. As we raise diffusion, we hear that sound become increasingly softer. What we're doing is increasing the amount of irregularity in the space. From no irregularity, a flat surface, to high irregularity. This other effect here, the diffuser size, also plays into that. While linked is the best place to use it until you're learning your way around, you can change the size of the irregularities. A high value here means the irregularities are fairly large. A low value means the irregularities are small. But like I say, it's best to leave it linked until you know your way around. The reverb type also has an effect on that. We'll talk more about the reverb type later on. Now that our audio source has bounced off of those first walls, we have to think about what those reflections actually look like. They may be coming from inside a stage house, from a back wall, from side walls, from the floor. We may be at some distance from the source. We may be very close. The way that we control our early reflections is the way that we manage that. We'll use our trusty old snare drum again. And we'll first of all look at what happens when we change the time of those early reflections. Do they happen all at the same time? Are they spread out over a larger time? Do we get silly and stretch it all the way out here? As you can see, that has a significant effect on the way that we perceive what's going on. But we also can control the weight of the energy. Even with the reflection spread out over that amount of time, is most of the energy early or late within that pattern? This is very important in controlling the sense of where we are relative to the audio source. And then finally, there's a tricky little parameter here called early slope. As you can see, the more I bring this down, this is a set of filters, the more I bring it down, the more we see red on the later reflections. This is something of a model of air absorption in that the highs tend to be filtered out as the signal proceeds through space. This is our way of controlling that. It's very subtle.
Now that we've set up our early reflections, it's time to focus on putting the signal into the reverberator itself. I'm going to do a few things to prepare. The first I'm going to do is turn down the early level over here, and I'm going to turn up the reverb level, so we're not hearing any of the early stuff. You can balance these however you want. It's just another way that you have control over your perception of the reverb. I'm also going to turn the diffusion back up. It's much more natural if we do that. Now you'll see down here, I have a window that looks a lot like the early reflection window. That's quite intentional. This is control over the way the signal moves into the reverb. We can scale how long it takes to go into the reverberator. We can control, does the first part of the energy go into the reverb more strongly? Does the latter part of the energy go into the reverb? You'll hear this as the sense of the reverb sort of ramping up more slowly or more quickly. And this envelope slope, again, is an air absorption filter. Now this is the point that we might look again at reverb type. I've set it up as a hall right now, which is generally more sparse than the other types of reverb. If I move it into chamber, you may not hear it well here, but it becomes more dense. The reflections inside of the reverb become a little more tight, and there's some slightly different characteristics to the filter. Move it toward a plate, it's denser still. A plate is really very small, so the reflections come on quickly. They also tend to be slightly more colored. With the right material, you'll hear that difference there. We have our signal in the reverb now, so it's time to control how long the reverb tail lasts and what sort of characteristic it has as it dies away. First, we see reverb size. This is more or less a model of how far apart the walls of the room might be. It might be small, or it might be quite large. Now, if you've been looking, you'll notice that the reverb time parameter is changing all by itself. The value you see is really just a displayed value, and it's a function of both the size and whatever the reverb time is actually set to be. So the best way to think of this is the reverb size is actually a room size, and the reverb time is the reflectivity of the room. If the room is absorptive, no matter what the size is, the time is going to be shorter. If the room is quite reflective, Again, no matter the size, the reverb time will be longer. You'll see this parameter is put right here so it's never hidden, because this is the one that most people go to quickly to make a change. They may change a preset, they may change other characteristics, but oftentimes there's just a need to make a short adjustment like that. Now the next thing that happens is well, how are the low frequencies in the reverb treated as the reverb dies away? Well, we have a crossover here that determines where low frequencies are. They're anywhere below the crossover. And we have a balance control here. And basically what that means is that if it shows low, if it's a value less than 50, the low frequencies will take longer to die away. So you'll hear the reverberation typically get darker as it gets older. Now this is a pretty good model of what really happens in the world. If you have the low mid balance up above 50, you'll notice that the high frequencies take longer to die away. Now this is less natural. It does happen, but this is the sort of thing that might be useful in a mix where you have a low frequency buildup that you want to avoid. We have another parameter called damping frequency. Damping frequency basically establishes where the high frequency part of the reverb is. So a frequency of 8 kilohertz is actually fairly high insofar as we can hear. And that means that this damping factor 
applies to frequencies above that. A high value of damping factor means that those values die away very slowly. Whereas a low value for damping factor means, especially if I bring this down a little bit more, you'll see the highs get sucked out of the reverb very quickly. Now finally, you'll see an interesting parameter down here called width. Now this is one that you handle with some caution. Normal is sort of a normal reverb effect. Narrow you might use if you're trying to slot some reverb in carefully into a mix, especially if you might be doing dialogue or a kick drum or something like that. You might actually have the reverb showing up as quite narrow, leaving the outer parts of the mix, the extreme left and right, to deal with something else. Now, when you take the reverb toward wider values, you may notice that the overall sense of reverberation gets much wider. Now, this is generally pleasant, but it comes with some hazards, because you have to assume that every mix you're going to make is going to be mono at some point. If you sell it to be background music in a movie, if it's on the radio, on television, it may very well be mono. When the reverb is wide like this, you may find that it's a little less mono compatible. Typically it shouldn't be bad, but you'll notice that you'll lose a little reverb in a mono down mix in this case. So it's perfectly fine to go there, but know what you're doing and make sure to check your mono monitoring every now and then. And there's a final bit of seasoning that you're going to need to add to your reverb preset before you save it. So let's, let's get this in context first. So I'm going to take the mix parameter down to something that's a little bit more useful. Now I'm doing it in line now so I can change the mix right here. Most of the time people bring reverb in on an aux channel and then just adjust the gain for reverb level. That's a probably better thing for the workflow, but it's up to you. The first thing I want to do here is adjust the early versus the reverb level. Now you'll notice here we still hear reverb, but it's much quieter. We have a perspective that puts us close to the instruments. If we want to move back and move a little farther away, we might reverse that. So we still have early signal, but our reverb itself is much stronger and we're effectively backed away from the instruments. Now we talked about reverb time. You may want to make some final tweaks or you may want to wait until you actually hear the material through the reverb. So that's something that can be adjusted quickly. We have filter on the output. We have four types. Only one can be used at a time. We have a 6 dB per octave filter, low pass. We have a 12 dB per octave low pass, and you can see the filter curve changing above. We have a high pass filter, again at 6 dB per octave, and a high pass filter at 12 dB per octave. Finally, we have a parameter called pre-delay. This is one of the most useful parameters in the kit for slotting the reverb in with your mix. It delays the reverb effect behind the main signal, gives you greater clarity, separates it a little bit. If you really want to be particular, you might match up tempo there too. Basically, the greater the value, the greater separation. Somewhere between 10 and 40 milliseconds or so is a pretty good place to be normally. If you move this out farther, the, the separation begins to be obvious. It might be a good effect, but it's not natural. So I'll bring it back here. And that's basically Reverb 101. Hope you learned some things. Thanks very much.